So I'm going to do my best to kind of go through time period or part of time period three with you here today. Um, there's five uh, Roman numerals that we're going to try to cover. So I'm probably not going to be able to do this in one screencast. It's probably going to be two screencasts that you're going to have to watch in order to get um, all this different material. The other important thing to understand is that there's a lot of material to cover. Um, this is not a comprehensive review of everything that we learned in class. Um, remember, you have to kind of go a little bit deeper and kind of fill in the details. This is just meant to kind of brush over the surface and refresh your memory of things that we've already learned throughout the school year. Okay, so what we're going to start with is kind of the beginning of this time period. So remember, you have to understand what defines the time period. So 1754 is the beginning of the French and Indian War, which is one of the most important wars in American history because all these things that happened during the French and Indian War kind of lead into the American Revolution. So we're going to get some of the background of the French and Indian War a little bit, why it was fought, some of the major causes behind it. So first thing to remember is that the French and Indian War is fought between the British and the American colonists fighting on the British side, and the French and a lot of their Native American allies. Uh, and the Native Americans, I want to say all but most Native Americans side with the French, uh, simply because they had a much better relationship with a lot of Native American tribes due to their limited uh, incursions on Native American lands and the fact that they're mostly engaged in the fur trade and not trying to expand um, their land as much as the British are. Now, um, what's behind this conflict? So uh, there's a lot of wars that are fought in the early 1700s ranging from you know the 1730s up into the 1750s over what we called in our class the backcountry area, right? And so remember that's the western part of the British colonies. Um, and this can be fought over a specific part of the back country called the Ohio country. And the Ohio country is kind of like western upstate New York, parts of the state of Ohio, kind of like the Great Lakes region, this northern part. And it's kind of, if you notice here, the, the red is the British, the blue is the French. It's like disputed territory between the British and the French. So they're going to fight a series of wars in the 1730s and 1740s over this back country, Ohio country um, area. So the names of these wars are Queen's Anne's, Queen Anne's Wars, um, King William's War, uh, and King George's War. Uh, now, all of these wars are named after the monarchs who were in charge of the British Empire at the time. They're not really conclusive wars. What you want to know about them is just in general that they're fought over this Ohio country, back country area, and they're kind of wars leading up to the bigger war, which is the French and Indian War, which does have a conclusive end to it and does kind of uh, have big ramifications for the French and British on North America, but also for the American colonists. Now, what we have to kind of understand is why are they fighting over this Ohio country? What makes it valuable? What makes it important? Well, there are several different reasons that make it important. Um, first one is that they're really fighting over like trading rights in these areas. And if, as I mentioned before, the French are primarily engaged in the fur trade, primarily beaver skins and beaver furs. Um, the British are engaged in this too. The backcountry settlers in um, the North American colonies of the British Empire are engaged in the fur trade and the beaver trade as well. And if you remember earlier in colonial America, they do fight a war or a series of wars known as the beaver wars over like the beaver trade specifically. Um, so it's valuable money and it's valuable trade. So that's the number one reason that the Ohio country uh, region is important. The second one really is to do with internal trading within North America. Um, it gives a lot of access to important waterways. Um, so one of those important waterways is the Ohio River, which eventually connects into the Mississippi River, which is way out west at this point in you know colonial world. With significant um, uh, river access and trading access. The other thing is another great series of waterways, which is the Great Lakes. Um, which is kind of like an, in, think of it like an internal ocean that can connect east and west for the French and for the British. Um, so those are really some of the major reasons for why those areas are, you know, pretty significant and pretty important um, for both sides. And they both kind of want to obtain it. The Native Americans are in between and the Native Americans just kind of want to like retain their autonomy in between these two great empires trying to fight over this territory. Now, really when you look at this in the larger scale, the French and Indian War is a part of a massive world conflict called the Seven Years War. Uh, and it's really about Britain and France kind of fighting for dominance. Um, 
in the world and trying to be the preeminent power. Spain has been on the decline um, since really like the 1600, 1600s, they've been on the decline. Britain and France have been on the rise. And this is going to determine who's the dominant world power. So it's really your first world war, your first global war that's fought on five continents, I believe. Okay, now what are the major effects of it? The first thing you want to understand here is that the effects of the French and Indian War are directly tied to the causes of the American Revolution. So you cannot really discuss one without the other. Um, this is very significant for our War of Independence that begins in 1776 because major changes happen as a result of the French and Indian War. So first thing is that um, the British really expel the French from mainland North America. If you look at these maps here, um, the British are going to gain all the land um, west of the Appalachian Mountains and east of the Mississippi River. They also gain all of Canada from the French. The British had also had holdings in Canada as well, but they're gaining all this land on mainland North America. Um, the British do retain Haiti, excuse me, the French do retain Haiti um, as uh, you know, an outpost here, a sugar island in the Caribbean. Uh, but essentially, the British are gaining dominance over North America. Now, what the Brit French Indian War also does is it also puts the British into an incredible amount of debt. Uh, and so, like, this is going to be the major triggering factor in a lot of ways for the American Revolution and, like, what the British do as a result of the debt that they're put in because of the French and Indian War. Um, so that's what we're really going to focus on, at least in the beginning here, and talk about the political and maybe some of the economic ramifications of this, you know, for the British um, and the American colonists. Okay, so political cause of the American Revolution. So a lot of these, which you have to understand here, the political, economic, and social causes of the American Revolution, they're all really kind of linked to one another in a lot of different ways. So we're going to try and break it down um, by political, social, and economic, um, but you know, you want to understand the connections between these different, um, you know, revolu excuse me, causes of the revolution. So when you look at the political causes of it, it is tied back to this debt that the French are put into as a result of the French and Indian War. So as a result of this, what the, the British start to do is they end their long-standing colonial policy of salutary neglect. So if you remember, salutary neglect was this idea that what this really means is beneficial neglect and what they did was they allowed the colonists to kind of have a high degree of self-government uh, and the British really weren't super directly involved um, like the Spanish were. The Spanish are much more directly involved in their colonies than the British um, and they kind of allowed the colonies to have self-government. So if you remember what that did for the colonies is that allowed um, democratic ideas to develop within the colonies um, and all the colonies developed some form of democracy, they all uh, developed some form of representative government, um, and that's really because the British are so hands-off in their approach to uh, colonial America. Now, this ends. So they have to try and now raise some revenue. So this, King George is who you're looking at here, and um, King George, along with Parliament, who was led by the Prime Minister Lord North at the time, they're going to start passing a series of different acts. So these are your major acts that the British are going to pass, and these are all departures from this policy of salutary neglect. Um, so we're not going to go through all of them here. I just wanted you guys to kind of um, make note of them. We will talk about some of them specifically later on. Um, but the one I highlighted here was the Stamp Act, and the reason I highlighted the Stamp Act, and you should remember this one as different from a lot of these other acts, the Stamp Act um, is your first First of all, it's your first internal tax on the colonies. A lot of these other taxes, like the Sugar Act, the Townsend Act, the Quartering Act, um, not the Quartering Act, excuse me, but the Tea Act, um, and even the Navigation Acts before this, these are um, taxes on imports, exports. The Stamp Act is an internal act, right? And that kind of gains the biggest resistance from the Americans of these different acts. Um, later on, kind of like the protest movements are growing, and that's why you see big reactions to the T Act and some of these later acts. Um, but the Stamp Act is different in a lot of ways, and it highlights um, what the colonists are going to be most upset about with the, the policies of um, ending salutary neglect. They feel like it's an infringement upon their rights as Englishmen. So remember, there's no concept of being an American yet, but they do feel like it's infringing upon their rights. 
They kind of see the Sugar Act and some of these other acts as in line with the Navigation Acts as far as regulation of trade. The Stamp Act, however, gets this big resistance. The Stamp Act Congress, the Sons of Liberties are formed um, because of the nature of the tax, that it's an internal tax and seen as different. Um, and it's a violation of their rights. Now that's a very important concept here. When you're looking at all of these acts, what this really goes back to is the Americans' ideology um, and their viewpoint about their rights and what rights they um, should have protected um, as English subjects. So um, what the colonists are going to say is that, you know, you're starting to tax us, you're changing your policies, right, but you're not giving us proper representation. Um, in Britain, we have a parliament. Everybody is represented in parliament. Therefore, the colonists should have representation as well. So you probably remember, we talked about this in class, and you heard this when you were younger, this idea of no taxation without representation. That's what the colonists were, were looking for. Um, and we learned in class a little bit something more specific, that the colonists actually wanted something called actual representation. And the British were kind of in favor or um, were holding the position of virtual representation. And really what this is, is that um, the colonists say that they want representation, and what they mean by that is they want actual representation, meaning they want representatives from their geographic area, from their colonies, sitting in parliament to speak for their specific desires, their needs, why they don't want some of these taxes placed upon them. Um, now, the British are going to say, well, you do have representation. Parliament represents the entirety of the British Empire. You don't need a person from your specific geographic area speaking for your specific needs um, in order to be represented uh, in the British Empire, represented by Parliament. So it's a difference of type of representation that they're looking for. Um, and so this highlights, I think, a growing difference politically and political thought between the colonists and the British. Um, and so the colonists are going to say, like, no, we want actual, they don't say actual representation, but that's how they define this, this terminology. Um, and the British are going to say, well, you do have representation already. Uh, and so, like, this kind of highlights the conflict here. And so when you see these different acts that are passed, why the colonists increasingly get upset and they start protest movements and they start you know, having congresses like the Stamp Act Congress um, to resist these acts is because they feel like their rights are being increasingly infringed upon that they're taking away their self-government. Um, things like the Quartering Act is taking away the British ability or the British uh, colonists and the American colonists' ability to govern themselves. And they feel like they're being watched, their governments are being watched. And then the Intolerable Acts at the end really take away a lot of what they consider to be um, like their fundamental rights, their uh, rights to govern, um, the, uh, the Massachusetts specifically, their right to govern um, on their own. Now, the last uh, political uh, cause we're going to talk about is the idea of the Enlightenment kind of influencing the Americans' thoughts. So, like, permeating American philosophy of the time period is this concept of natural rights. So, if you remember, John Locke lays out a lot of natural rights in his uh, books that he writes, Life, Liberty, Property, the idea of, um, you know, being able to overthrow your government if you believe it's unjust. These are all laid out by Enlightenment thinkers like Locke. The other idea is that represent, rep, representative democracy is something that permeates the Enlightenment. Uh, and you have people like Montesquieu arguing for separation of power in the government. You have all different Enlightenment thinkers like Voltaire um, and Locke arguing for representative government as the best form of government. So this coincides with American self-government experiences and this philosophy of country ideology. Uh, that permeates American thought uh, and being uh, fearful of too powerful of a central government and wanting the power to come back to the people. This has been their experience through when they had the policy of salutary neglect that they were able to develop on their own and coupled with the Enlightenment has a big political influence on Americans of the time. Okay, we're going to continue the second half of this with part two of the this time period and kind of going through cause of the American Revolution. Um, so just make sure you watch a second video as well that's going to follow.